Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Cargos, and today I am very excited and I'm very proud to present for your viewing pleasure this 60 Hunter PVE Field Manual. Now, this was by far the most ambitious project I've ever taken on. When it comes to YouTube stuff, this easily took 200 hours plus to get done, but it was very rewarding. I learned a lot. I had the great honor and privilege of working alongside some of the best hunters from around the world. Guys that have uh, had great success, uh, not only in OG Vanilla, but have, have had great success on private servers, have some of the top parses on uh, on uh, Legacy players. So it was a lot of fun. And uh, so, so the vision for this project was to create a truly comprehensive resource for those of you that are interested in playing classic uh, Hunter and Classic WoW and experiencing uh, the PvE content. So this is going to be a great, a huge knowledge jump of sorts. This is 130 slides plus. Let's get right into it. So I, I have to say... This video is just meant to supplement the actual guide. The guide is going to be found in the description below. It's a link out to a Google Slides presentation. It's cloud-based. We can all comment on it. We can improve upon it. It's the nature of the beast with video guides. The second I put it out there, it's going to be imperfect. I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. So just take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. And uh, should be a good time. So let's do it. First off, here's your chain of command. Here are the guys I was talking about. Some real legends in the mix here. Now, Rosaya the Ravager, I, I, I'm a huge fan of this guy on YouTube. Back in back during Nost, I used to watch all of his videos, his Hunter tutorials. Um, I just think he's a world-class guy, so nice, so knowledgeable. He was on Countdown to Classic. You may have heard him there with Time Cop. Talking about Hunters, uh, man, such such a treat getting to work with him. Corn Holy, raided with uh, Taladril and Scuba Cops, Serenathus. Fade has some sick parses on, on Legacy players. Uh, myself, Watcher6, he's a, he's a TC guy in the Hunter Discord, very quantitative, really helped a lot with the spreadsheets and the research. Um, Alondris as well, man, we, we, dude, how many times did we look this guy over Alondris, man? Big shout out to you, man. Appreciate everything that you did. Uh, and Camelot. So here's the, you know, the Hunter class leaders right here, so to speak. <clears throat> here's a table of contents. We won't break it down too much. We, uh, we're just going to assume that you just hit 60, so we're going to congratulate you and we're going to kind of uh, evaluate the server environment and figure out your first moves. We're going to get into rotation. A um, lot to unpack here. So we'll go over some of the nuances of your shots, rotation fundamentals, single target, multi-target, full verse clip, gear swapping, trinket rotation, melee weaving, kiting, things like this. Hunter stats. We're going to get into the real basics, the foundational stuff, range avoidance 101. We'll talk about hit cap, crit cap. Um, we're going to talk about stat weights, progressive stat weights. It's not a term you hear too often, but we're going to break down the stat weights um, you, at each different raid tier. So we're going to put full BIS gear on, and then we're going to find the stat weights so you can find out how much uh, attack power 1% crit is worth, how much attack power 1% hit is worth, um, how much AP do you get per point of agi. This is stuff that's going to be useful for you um, as you decide on a piece-by-piece -piece basis how to itemize. Then we're going to talk about 100 talents. There's four main specs we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about 100 pets. This is something I love talking about, very requested uh, topic. I'll give you a brief annotated history of Hunter Pets. I, I went back to the WoW Wiki site and, and went, went patch by patch and really broke it down and, and finally, finally, I think, got the story straight. We're going to go over all the pet breeds, the holy trinity. I've listed them all out by attack speed uh, under 2.0. Beast training, big topic that doesn't really get talked about that much. We're going to talk about progressive beast training, how you're going to spec your pet out for each pet, I mean, for each uh, raid tier. Some other stuff related to pets as well, but anyway, we're going to talk about uh, the hunter's gear. So how does hunter BIS even work? What does the range weapon progression look like? And then we have progressive itemization here. We've broken down uh, pre-bis, bypatch, phase one, which is Molten Core, Blackwing Lair, Zul Group, Ankaraj, and Aksaramas. Rezaia has some really nice thoughts on the armor sets, which I've included as well. Then we have gear enchants, world buffs, and consumables. We've got some, some hunter tools. And we'll finish off with the hunter, the hunter income. We'll talk about Maradon Princess runs real quick, Dire Mall Tribute runs, Farming Devil Soul Leather. We're going to have links out the guides in these. Won't spend too much time on that stuff, though. All right, let's hop right into it, guys. Congratulations, you just hit level 60. You're a hunter. I know, you know, some classes have it worse, but getting to level 60 in vanilla in any class is an achievement. You should be proud of yourself. Congrats. So there are three main broad objectives that you can uh, pursue in Classic WoW three kind of currencies so to speak the first is gold very self-explanatory gear and the third one is social standing so what do i mean by this it's like going back and mob tagging for friends or earning good rapport on your server there's some sort of value there and you can allocate time towards that so the real tldr here is this 
evaluate the server environment, figure out is it fresh, is it established, where are you in relation to the pack? Are you ahead? Um, are you behind? Are you right in the middle? Because this is going to factor into your line of play, right? Like if you're one of the first on a server, you're probably going to want to do all the open world stuff that's available to you that's not going to be available to other people, like farming devil sword leather or herbing or whatever it might be, taking advantage of uh, having that open area to yourself. Um, now, if you're playing solo with no guild and no confirmed rating spot, you may want to forgo gold as a priority and just get as much uh, gear as possible to get your epic mount, to get your attunement squared away so that you can be an easy you know, an easy uh, acquisition for a guild that's looking to bring you bring you into our raid slot. Prioritize objectives. These are some of the many things you can do in Classic World of Warcraft. By no means am I trying to tell you how to play, but here are some things you can keep in mind and may influence your decision making. Free, if you can free farm devil sores before a, a mafia or a cartel forms, do it. These are not only needed for you to craft your own prebis uh, items with the devil source set, but they also retain value very well. You can go out and tame a cat, a wolf, and a wind serpent, make sure their abilities are trained to max, and you're good to go on the, on the pet front. Loyalty level, all that stuff. Uh, you can farm Dire Maul North tribute runs. You can farm Marad and Princess runs. You want to get your attunement squared away. Molten Core, Onyxia's Lair. There are links. Uh, if you go to the, the actual guide in the Google link below, there will, there will be links out to those guides, video guides. Also, you're going to be competing for the most competitive uh, prebis. You're going to be competing with warriors and rogues and other hunters to get stuff like True Strikes and Dal Dalrens. Everybody and their mama wants that stuff. Um, so ideally, you want to lead your own dungeon groups um, if you can, if at all possible, so you can optimize the group composition, give yourself the best possible chance of acquiring the gear that you need to acquire. Tier 2 priorities. Uh, on a real on a fresh server, if you're one of the first to 60, you might be able to play the auction house a little bit, invest that gold, snipe some cheap stuff. Sometimes some stuff is, is listed uh, under value. Buying rare recipes, getting your thorium ammo recipe, leveling up engineering, buying fap, frost oil recipe, all this stuff, right? All right, I'm not going to spend too much on that. So the hunter role in a nutshell in a group PvE environment is you're going to be a, a mobile ranged physical damage dealer with high utility. We've been back and forth on this, Navic and Egregious and Ale and I, we're all, we're all talking about, do hunters have high utility? Um, sort of come to the consensus that they do. They have a lot of utility. They can pull, they can kite. They can potentially, a good hunter can potentially uh, change the, the strat you're going to implement when it comes to, to, to different boss fights, different encounters. Uh, one of the key pieces of utility is removing Frenzy. This is almost going to guarantee at least a couple slots for hunters in a raid with Trank Shot. Uh, crowd control, buffing, you can be a good uh, viable Nightfall wielder. Tier 2 set bonus, exposed weakness is very, is, is very solid, very strong uh, buff. Uh, aspect of the pack, Hunter's Mark, True Shot Aura. All right, we're going to talk about the hunter rotation now. This is the meat and potatoes of things. This is, there's a lot to unpack here, so I'll try and break it down as simple as I possibly can. I'm going to start off with just the nuances of your shot. Auto shot, multi shot, they say instant on the tool tip. They're not instant. They have like a hidden 0.5 second cast time to them. You cannot use them while moving. Auto shot's cooldown is going to depend on your ranged weapon's attack speed. It's just your auto shot of your ranged weapon's attack speed, right? So stuff like your quiver, uh, quick shots, procs, rapid fire, juju flurry, this stuff will impact how fast you shoot. You cannot auto shot while moving. Uh, same thing with multi shot. One tip with multi shot is something I learned from Rosaya back in the day watching his videos. Down rank multi shot is probably the best way for you to conserve mana and uh, optimize your damage. Um, you don't lose all that much damage, but you save a lot of mana. Now, you really shouldn't have that many mana issues as a hunter if you're popping demonic runes and major mana potions, but if you do, um, this is one great way that you can, uh, you know, still do good damage and uh, decrease your mana consumption down ranking multi shot and there's even rank one multi shot still going to benefit from talents good stuff so you're probably already familiar with this by now since you just leveled a hunter but uh multi shot fires projectiles in a predictable conal pattern that you can kind of memorize and uh it allows you to uh you know you're going to get kind of a sixth sense with this stuff so you're going to know when to use it when not to use it and when it might be a liability next shots up aim shot arcane shot they both share the same cooldown that's why they're on the same slide so if you aim shot, you can't arcane shot right after. If you arcane shot, you can't aim shot right after. Aim shot is your highest damage dealing shot. It is a three second cast and a six second cooldown. Can't do anything about the cooldown, but you can do something about the cast. So stuff that increases your attack speed will reduce the cast time of aim shot. You cannot use aim shot while moving. You can use aim shot. Uh, you can use arcane shot while moving. So both multi shot, I'll go back a slide. So both, both multi shot and aim shot both benefit from your weapon uh from your weapon damage so prioritizing slow weapons with a high damage range is going to be optimal for you so aim shots uh, uh aim shots uh, cast time during a quick shots proc quick shots again is the is the proc from the aspect of uh 
aspect of the hot hawk tier one talent in the beast mash in the beast master tree. During a quick shot's proc, it has a 2.3 second cast. During rapid fire, it's 2.14, and if you uh, if you align rapid fire with quick shots, it's 1.65. All right, so arcane shot, down ranking arcane shot can be fantastic as well. Uh, it can just be like a ranged poke type thing. That's another thing that I took verbatim from Rezaya. It's a way to keep stuff in, keep uh, a player or a uh, or a mob in combat with you. There's a lot of potential utility with Arcane Shot, and uh, you know one thing interesting about interesting thing about Arcane Shot. So it doesn't scale with attack power; it scales with spell damage. Um, it does ignore armor. It can be partially or fully resisted. So it's functioning as a spell in many respects, but it follows the melee hit table. Um, it doesn't have that that big. Uh, I think it's like 17% penalty from spells. <clears throat> so Hunter Shots are kind of in a, like a unique category. So yeah, down ranking it. Uh, good stuff. There are some situations uh, where mobility is an issue you're not gonna be able to cast damn shots so you and for six seconds or something like that then you might as well throw in an arcane shot right um all right rotation fundamentals pay attention this is really important if you take two things and two things only from this guide it's gonna make you a better hunter player it's this one understand that, the, that your auto shot is the bread and butter of your damage uh, i want you to think of auto shot as like a pendulum swinging back and forth you always want to keep the pendulum swinging and you want to weave both your movement and abilities between cooldowns or between the swings in the pendulum all right, so your auto shot is key, and you're never really going to get a hundred percent uptime on your auto shot, but you want to get damn near as close as you possibly can get. All right, so we're going to talk about full version of the rotation, clipped version of the rotation. All this stuff pertains to auto shot, not anything else. Auto shot is just is the key, and the second thing that I want you to take away from this guide, if you learn nothing else, <clears throat> is download an auto shot timer. Because in order to accurately monitor the pendulum swings, you're going to need some visual way to do that. So what you're seeing on the left side of the screen here is a picture of Rosaya shooting, popping off his crossbow, and you're going to see this little bar. Um, I wish it was animated. It's not. But this bar will kind of fill up and reset over and over again, and it will tell you when you're good to move when you're when, or when you need to plant your feet and get ready to shoot. So keep that in mind, guys. The optimal ranged weapon speed to maximize auto shot uptime, where it's going to slot in with your, your cooldowns really well, is 3.45 seconds. This weapon doesn't exist. So you're inevitably, you're inevitably going to reach situations, run into situations, where you're going to have to make a decision on whether or not you're going to auto shot, or you're going to use aim shot right away, or multi shot right away, and we're going to get into that more later. As a hunter, you're going to want to gravitate towards ranged weapons with high damage range and slow weapon speed. And because you're going with the slow weapon speed, if you miss even one auto attack, that's going to be severely detrimental because you're not attacking that fast. Okay, let's move on. Here is the first look at the full single target rotation. Don't get overwhelmed. We'll take it piece by piece. If you're a new hunter player, you can ignore the burst CDs thing at the, at the beginning. You can ignore the stuff about flex spots, optional raptor strikes, uh, or feign death trinket swapping. Just know this, in essence, the core of the Hunter rotation is an auto shot to start. Why an auto shot first? Because you want to get that pendulum swinging back and forth. Then you're going to want to weave stuff between swings in this pendulum. So you auto shot first, then you aim shot. As soon as you start that aim shot, you're going to send your pet. Bake it into the ability to do something like that. Uh, pet control is very big, we'll talk about it later. Um, why, why do you not start with the pet attacking first? Because your pet can potentially beat the tank to the target and uh, be a liability uh, to your to your group. So you wanna start with an auto shot, best practice to send your pet as you start casting that first aim shot. Then you're, you're gonna go another auto shot, which will happen automatically after, most likely. And then you're gonna go multi-shot, two auto shots, and then you're gonna aim shot again. That's, that's like the, in essence. So with many things in vanilla, on a surface level, it can be very basic, uh, but when you factor in everything you can do to like min-max your rotation, the rabbit hole goes deep, um, so we'll talk about it a little bit more now. So that second auto shot after your multi shot, this is what I like to call the flex spot. If you're going to do something a little spicy, you're going to want to do it at this spot. Um, now it may not only it may may not always be two auto shots before the aim shot. You see what I'm saying? Because auto shot is going to depend on what actual weapon you have. It's going to be different on a weapon to weapon basis. And we have a list at the end of this power of the end of this presentation showing what version of the rotation you're going to end up using based on what exact weapon you have. It's going to math out differently with different breakpoints. But that flex spot, you can feign death trinket swap. You can weave in a melee strike and a goblin sapper charge. Also, why do you want to pop burst cooldowns right at the start? Why wouldn't I wait for that first 
aim shot to finish casting because like, we're not even in combat potentially at that point is because you want to use your burst cooldowns right at the start of the fight so you have more of an opportunity to use them later also it's going to reduce your aim shot cast time as we said not the cooldown but it'll it'll reduce that um, and as well as increase the speed of your auto shots anyway okay if hunter's mark is a authorized debuff slot sometimes most of the time i'd say in raids it's, it's authorized as the 16th debuff slot we're going to want to apply that before combat obviously so uh yeah down ranking multi-shot flex spot we talked about it so there's your first look at the single target rotation we're going to talk about full versus clip now don't think of clipped as bad don't think of full as good they're neutral it depends on your on a weapon to weapon basis which version of the rotation you're going to use it all comes down to your auto shot when you're talking about full version it's talking about your auto shot when you talk about clipped version it's talking about your auto shot so let me break it down for you check it out aim shot six second cooldown multi shot 10 second cooldown auto shot variable cooldown like i said before these three things are not always going to align perfectly so you're going to reach a situation many times where the pendulum is swinging and you're auto shotting and you you start your auto shot, but at this but your your aim shot is coming off cooldown right at the same time. What do you do? Do you finish your auto shot? Do you finish casting that auto shot, or do you immediately smash that key bind for aim shot to immediately use your ability the second it comes off cooldown? This is the essence of the full verse clipped versions of your damage rotation cycle. If you opt to use that ability the second it comes off cooldown, the millisecond it comes off cooldown, that is a clipped damage rotation cycle because you're clipping your auto shot. Um, now, if you decide to let that auto shot finish before casting your aimed or multi-shot or whatever, this is a full damage rotation cycle. So there's only really four major weapons, ranged weapons you're gonna use throughout the entirety of vanilla. And three out of four of them are gonna tell you to use your full, your full damage rotation cycle. So it's almost a best practice to not get trigger happy and smash the keybind and use your abilities right away. But the first major weapon upgrade you get is Roctolar, and that's gonna the math it maths out in a way where clipped is actually gonna do more damage. So important it's important to know conceptually what I'm talking about here. I hope this stuff is making sense. Uh, but that's the essence of what the full verse clipped is. Here's a visual demonstration of what the clipped single tar target rotation looks like and how to implement it. So at the bottom here, you see a green bar. This is a timeline in seconds from 0 to 11 seconds. You see with the brown cast time and the gray cooldown bar, that's your auto shots. We're assuming you have no gear on, you're completely unbuffed, you have no quiver, you have a 3.0 second attack speed ranged weapon equipped. You're going to 0.5 cast time, you know, start your auto shot. It's going to have a 3 second cooldown, right? Because it's a 3 second attack speed weapon. You're going to see your rotation play out and be executed just like we talked about. And then you're going to reach a situation once you start to get like second 8, 9, 10, 11, where your aim shot's coming off cooldown, but you're getting ready to auto shot again. What do you do? Um, do, you, do, you, do you do the next auto shot or do you just smash aim shot right away? Um, now, if you were to just smash aim shot right away, let's say you have Rock the Law equipped, this would be an example of the clip single target rotation. All right, we're going to go just show you quick examples. We have all the itemization later on, but this is just what I was talking about before. First weapon you'll likely have is Bloodseeker from uh, doing the Alterac Valley quest. Really good. Full full, full rotation. Full version of the rotation. Um, so then the next weapon upgrade is going to be Rockdalar. This is going to be clipped. It's going to be a clipped version of the rotation. The third upgrade is going to be Ashdrithul from Cromagus and Blackwing Lair. This weapon is going to take you all the way to Big KT, all the way to... Uh, Nexoramus, this weapon is, is phenomenal for hunters. Um, you're going to be using the full version of your damage rotation cycle. Fourth and final weapon that you're going to be using is going to be Abyss Forever's Nerubian Slave Maker, full version of the damage rotation cycle. Moving on, gear swapping. You may have seen rogues do this, you may have seen hunters do this, but in Classic WoW you can't switch gear around while in combat other than weapons, right? You can throw on a shield, sword and board, you can throw on weapons, but you can't switch around gear. Now, um, you can get around this as a hunter and kind of with a rogue as well if you vanish if you feign death there will be a moment in the combat between the combat pulses that you can swap around not only trinkets but gear as a whole you can swap around set bonuses you can put on new new trinkets this is most applicable when it comes to trinkets this is this is not a niche thing this is actually very important for you to be successful as a hunter you're gonna have to get into you're gonna have to get into the mindset of swapping trinkets around so you guys know that in vanilla, a lot of the trinkets have very powerful on-use effects. So you can cycle through multiple of these trinkets throughout the course of a fight. 
with your feign death cooldown. Um, so you're pretty much gonna, you know, expend your your on use trinkets initially. Wait to get full value from them because if you feign death and trinket swap before you've gotten the full value from them, let's say you have a trinket that gives you attack power for 30 seconds. If you feign death five seconds into the uh, effect of that trinket and you swap trinkets, you're going to lose that effect. So you want to first extract full value from the trinkets, then you're going to want to go ahead and proceed to feign death, then swap trinkets. You're going to have to do it pretty quick. You're, you're going to likely need something like Outfitter in order to make this happen. A few, th few key things to keep in mind. There's only one on-use trinket in the game that is usable alongside another on-use trinket, and that is Badge of the Swarm Guard. This is a phenomenal trinket. It drops off Battle Guard Sartura in Encourage. Aside from this, you can't stack on-use trinkets. I think the reason why Badge of the Swarm Guard operates in this way is because it gives you a chance as opposed to just giving you some flat, you know, bonus for a bunch of seconds or whatever. Second thing you need to keep in mind is that when you swap into a new a new trinket, you're going to have 30 seconds with that new tr while that new trinket's like cooling down before you can use it. So you have to keep this in mind. Um, and then the third thing, oh, and part of that second thing is what I said before. You want to extract full value from your trinkets before you decide to swap them. The last thing I'll say, it's so another key tip, is to recall your pet back to you. Make sure he's not attacking the boss when you decide to execute a trinket swap. Because it will, if, you're, if your pet is on the boss, once your pet attacks the boss, it's going to put you back into combat. And it's going to reduce that opportunity between uh, the pulses of combat to execute this trinket swap. <clears throat> Moving on. Alright, so check it out. Here's another trinket. Renataki's Charm of Beast. This is Biss Forever for Hunters. This is phenomenal, and it impacts your rotation. Um, it's not it's not the craziest thing ever, but I think it's important to spell out. Um, the, I think you get this from that uh, that ZG event, right? I forgot what it's called, but anyway, um, you're gonna e execute your your rotation per per normal, right? Everything looks normal, right? But then on that flex spot, the aforementioned flex spot, what you're gonna do at this stage is you're going to pop Renataki's Charm of Beast, right? In in place of that second auto shot, it's going to reset the cooldown on aim shot and multi shot. Don't worry about volley or arcane. And then you're going to immediately aim shot and re-execute the full version of your damage rotation cycle. All right. Um, so you're able to like double up. You're like double dipping on your um, on your aim shot and multi shot. And that one shot macro we're popping is there our boost burst cooldowns. Ideally, it's going to be rapid fire alongside Badge of the Swarm Guard that I just talked about. So you're able to basically stack the effect of Renataki's Charm of Beast with uh, the effect of uh, Badge of the Swarm Guard. Okay, so then after your initial burst of rapid fire resolves, right? The effect of rapid fire is no longer. You don't have a quick shots active, something like that. What you're gonna want to do is you're gonna you're going to wait till you're that next flex spot arises after that multi shot. So it's gonna go multi shot auto auto on that second auto. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go potentially if you want to try hard, you can go into you can pop, you can throw a goblin sapper charge, feign death, swap to your next set of trinkets, whether that be a passive trinket or another on-use trinket, and uh, proceed and resume your rotation at that point. Alright, so if you're playing a Troll Hunter, which is uh, Biss on the Horde side as far as PvE DPS, we got some tips for you courtesy of Alondris, who plays uh, Troll Hunter. If it's a 3-5 to five minute fight, okay, so, okay, before I start on that, Berserking is a 3 minute cooldown, Rapid Fire is a 5 minute cooldown. If you're unfamiliar with what Berserking does, Berserking gives you between a 10% and 30% haste bonus based on how much health you have. So the lower the health you have, it's very flavorful ability. You'll be, uh, you'll you'll getting you'll be you'll be getting more of a of a haste bonus, right? So if it's a three to five minute fight, use both on the pull. After three minutes, use the troll one again asap. Five to six minute fight, use both on the pull. Wait the two minutes, then use both again. This is again if you have a good sense of how long a fight's going to take. If it's a six plus minute fight, use both on the pull. Use troll again asap after three minutes. And then you're going to run into a situation where rapid fire is off cooldown. Uh, do you use it right away? The recommendation here is to wait an additional minute because that's what it's going to take for your, your berserking to recharge a third time and use them again together. Now, this is the key takeaway. If you have access to berserking and you're going to use them both together, you're not going to aim shot. You're not going to aim shot if both of these are active. You're gonna get more value from your auto from your auto shots, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, now, if you really want to try hard, and and some pro troll hunters do this, what you can do is before the fight, you can unequip all of your gear, then reequip it, which will leave you with low health already. And this is going to increase the effect berserking is gonna have on you and give you closer to that 30% uh, effect. 
Now, another thing you can do to further optimize is you can pop a demonic rune and make yourself go even lower. So when you start the fight and you pop both, you're legit AK-47 mode, just, just popping off like crazy at the boss. It's not a butters. All right, moving on. Multi-target rotation. Uh, you're going to lay a trap before the fight. Auto shot, multi-shot, auto shot. You can throw whatever consumables you have. Oil of immolation, explosive consumable. You can weave in a second feign death into a second trap. Again, traps are only usable out of combat. The main key takeaway here is you're going to prioritize multi-shot over aim shot. But at the same time, if you prioritize multi-shot over aim shot, in the long run, it's going to mess up your rotation. The timing is going to get messed up. So I would only recommend this uh, against basically three plus targets and if the fight's only going to last a couple damage rotation cycles if it's going to if it's going to drag out you may as well just optimize you, you may as well just use the single target rotation all right with with aim shot as a priority there's something about using the 10 second cooldown first before the six second cooldown that jacks it all up if you're fighting in a huge amount of mobs and i don't really know the exact break break point we put 10 there if you're fighting a ton of mobs you can channel volley all right, rotation priority, melee ability. So Raptor Strike functions like Heroic Strike. It queues up with your next auto attack, gives you a little bonus to melee damage. Interesting thing is this. The other Hunter melee abilities, so Mongoose Bite and Counterattack and Wing Clip, you can use them at the same time. They operate independently. Um, and Mongoose Bite and Counterattack are only situationally available after you dodge your parry. Wing Clip is always available to you. And that's why their Hunters are so good at Swing and Nightfall. We'll get into that on the next slide. But you can use like wing clip the same time you use raptor strike you can use mongoose the same time you have raptor strike that's why you have like those one button melee macros for hunters we're gonna get into nightfall if you are the designated nightfall wielder uh, this is your rotation it's very simple you're gonna go ahead and raptor strike and uh, wing clip at the same time rank one wing clip whatever your man is gonna permit and be able to sustain right uh, then you're just gonna keep spamming rank one wing clip until you get this little proc this debuff proc so if you're not if you're unfamiliar with what nightfall does it's a crafted weapon uh, gives you a chance on hit to increase spell damage taken by the target by 15% for five seconds so once the debuff procs you're gonna stop spamming wing clip at this point you can go back into uh, range and pop off one ranged ability if you want and then once it falls back off you're going to go back into melee range and start uh, rinsing and repeating this rotation to try and keep Nightfall up as much as possible. So some guilds will have off tanks use Nightfalls. I think Hunters are fantastic at wielding Nightfalls since they have access to just like an on-demand actual strike over and over again. Very little cost. Um, all right, how to kite. This is going to be an expectation for you as a hunter. This is one of your essential skills. It's going to be required knowledge. People will expect you to be able to kite. Um, and it's just something that you should, you should, you should know. So... You can totally kite without these things, but minor movement speed to boots and swiftness potions will definitely help you a lot. Um, now, the reason why you want to, you know, kite a mob is potentially you want to just, like, jerk it around for strategic value so it's not killing your group, or you want to whittle it down without taking damage. So, as you guys know, mobs out in the open world, they move faster. You Generally, they move faster than you. Generally, they attack faster than you. So, kiting, being able to slow them and control their movement is... Uh, is neutralizing those advantages they have over you. So here's the kiting rotation. If ideally you want to pull with aim shot, right? Why not? High damage, there's a cast time to it. But oftentimes you may not have the opportunity to start with an aim shot. And in this case, you're likely going to start with a distracting shot. Distracting shot is actually quite useful in, in this game. It, it uh, generates high threat and is able to rip the threat off the target. If you need to save someone's life or something, you can start off with the distracting shot. Now at this point, you're going to send your pet in to attack one time and one time only, then you're going to recall it. If you let your pet sit on the target, he's not going to move anywhere, right? But the reason why you want to do this is you want to get your pet to have threat on the table, right? So then when you recall, like, so if you have to feign death later or something like that, the mob's just not going to reset, right? So, but then, so you're going to get one attack on it, then you're going to pull it back. Now, at this point, you're going to auto shot, concussive shot. It doesn't have to be like a super strict rotation. Keep concussive shot up on cooldown. Make sure it's always up. You can downrank Serpent's Thing or Arcane Shot, uh, so they're really low cost, and it just keeps like that combat pulse going so they don't break the leash. Uh, before the fight, the fight you want to activate uh, Cheetah, so you have a movement speed increase. If the mob is, for whatever reason, able to close the distance between you, you're going to want to take off Cheetah so you don't get dazed, put on Aspect of the Monkey. Uh, now, at this point, you can wing clip it and proceed to run away. If your threat has threat on the table, you can feign death, put a trap down or something like that, and rinse and repeat. This is the kiting rotation. Now we're going to talk about Hunter stats. This is juicy. So we'll go over ranged avoidance basics. Your base chance to miss against a target of equal level, so level 60 target, is 5%. Easy, right? Now bosses are skull level targets. Now the game considers them level 63 targets. 
your chance to miss a level 63 target is 8.6%. Nobody knows exactly why this is. Taladril has a great theory on it. Uh, his theory is that uh, for every level past 60 a mob is, you'll have an additional 1% chance to miss baked into that. Now, uh, the weapon skill difference of 15 would be would would mean that basically each point of weapon skill would increase your chance to hit by 0 0.04. So if you have five weapon skill, it's 0.2. So at level 63, that would net out to the 8.6. No one knows for sure. A key takeaway is 8.6. Because you're likely not able to get fractions of a percent, most hunters will tell you hit cap is 9%. <clears throat> All right. So this is really important. Listen up. I might say it twice. If you're half conscious right now, just like, you know, just pay attention for one second. Keep in mind that hunters are unique in the sense that their ranged attacks can't be dodged, they can't be parried, and they can't be subjected to a glancing blow. If you're unfamiliar with what glancing blows are, it's a static 40% chance to do like 30% less damage. Like the flavor of it is, I guess, you're hitting them with a the sword and the sword kind of like, like chips their armor and like doesn't do full damage. So that's what a glancing blow is. So your ranged abilities can't be subject to that or dodged or parried. So they can only be miss or blocked. And you can get around the whole block thing by shooting from behind. The mob's unable to block if you're shooting from behind. So what does this mean? This means your crit cap is 100%. A lot of other classes have a lower crit cap because they have to deal with dual wielding. They have to deal with glancing blows. You don't have to deal with that nonsense. And this 9% hit or whatever it is, is going to remain true for both your white attacks and your yellow attacks. All right. So you can crit up to 100%, meaning that you'll crit every time. Um, anyway. Moving on. Stat basics. Don't want to talk too much about this. You guys all probably know this. One Agi uh, increases attack power with ranged weapons by two and melee weapons by one. Uh, there's an armor. You get increased armor, increased dodge. Intellect increases your raw mana pool, your chance to critically hit with spells, and the rate you train weapon skills. Stamina is just raw health. Uh, spirit is going to increase your out-of-combat health regeneration, but it's going to increase both your out-of-combat and in-combat mana regeneration if you don't cast per the five-second rule. Okay. So what does strength do for you? It increases your melee attack power. Now there's a value here for 1% crit. Uh, 53 agility is marksmanship, or it's 46 if you're going survival with the lightning reflexes. Don't worry about that now. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Same thing with dodge, though. There's another value if you're going marks or survival. All right, here's the stat weights. So the first iteration of this guide, I had a very simple stat priority system where I was like, agility over attack power, and it was very unsophisticated. I was talking with a lot of the good hunters, and they were like, man, we need to like improve this. So this is what we came up with. Plus 1% hit up to cap is approximately equal to 1% crit is greater than 1, one agi is greater than 2 AP and then stam int strength. Now, the reason why stam is over strength is a very quick note is that hunters apparently shouldn't have mana issues. If you're popping demonic runes, if you're popping ma ma mana potions, if you're doing what you need to do, you should be totally good when it comes to mana. So hit cap is 9%. We talked about this. All this we just talked about one second ago. All right, here's the stat weights. Here's progressive stat weights. This is very interesting. Shout out to Watcher6 for doing this. He has a great spreadsheet, which I'll link at the end of this presentation, where basically, what are stat weights? Stat weights are going to allow you to compare compare gear and how to itemize on a piece-to-piece -piece basis. If you want to figure out how much AP 1% crit is worth, how much AP is 1% hit worth, these stat weights are going to give you some semblance of a way to do that. Now, stat weights are, in, are just inherently dynamic. The only real true good way to do this is if you had some like dynamic crazy algorithm that would calculate everything, racials, buffs. The second you change one variable, the stat weights are technically off. So what we did is we just took a snapshot with the BIS gear at each stage of the game, pre-BIS, MC, BWL, so on and so forth. And we calculated the stat weights given a 2031 marksman survival build, two minute fight, zero armor, full consumes. We did unbuffed and then we also did full consumes raid buff per the content phase, BIS gear uh, selected per DPS gain, uh, so on and so forth. So as you can see, in previous gear, one Agi is worth 2.58 AP, 1% hit and crit, as we said, are approximately equal to each other, and that's 30.87 AP. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Again, link down in the description to the presentation. Um, once, you get, once you get to this bridge and you need to cross this bridge, you can come here and start looking at uh, stat weights, and hopefully you'll be able to itemize in the most optimal way. All right, so moving on, PvE talent builds. This is juicy stuff to talk about. All right, this is the entry level spec. Some hunters subscribe to this, some don't. I subscribe to this. Now, this build uh, assumes you're kind of fresh, fresh server. Your your guild's about to hop into molten core. You're undergeared. You're about to get down to some business. 
Now this this spec is good because it gives you 3% additional hit through your talents with Surefooted and Survival. You still have access to True Shot Aura. You still have access to the 5% uh, multiplier to damage uh, deep down in the March tree. You still have a couple points in Aspect of the Hawk. Great spec. Allows you to get to uh, the uh, the hit cap um, much faster. And uh, even, even stuff like the early survival talents will benefit you a little bit in, uh, in Molten Core. Like the ones that give you the plus 1% damage to uh, like whatever it is, I forgot. Uh, anyway, Molten Core BM spec. Some hunters, uh, some hunters, pretty much swear by this. Even post 1.9, they say that this is this is this is going to be optimal in Molten Core. Your pet's doing a lot of damage comparatively, um, and this is going to be more optimal than the sure-footed spec. Something to keep in mind. I don't personally know too much about this spec. Next one is the tried and true. This is the bread and butter. You can use this pretty much the entirety of the game past like the sure-footed stage. Once you're able to get you know your hit um, unbuffed to cap. Then this is the spec that can carry you all the way through tier three. Uh 203310, classic bread and butter hunter spec. People like know about this. Um pretty much really good. Uh optimizes, you know, you get the five 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 points in hawk, you get the 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 damage multipliers and marksmanship. Um now one thing I will say though is that depending on what raid you're doing, you're gonna want to put uh points into monster slaying or humanoid slaying. That's what it's called. So humanoid slaying is going to increase like your damage versus humanoids by 1% per point and the critical strike bonus by 1% per point. So some raids like ZG or something like that or uh, BW or BWL is all dragonkin, right? So monster slaying is super good there. If you're going ZG, uh, humanoid slaying is super good. So depending on what raid you're doing, you can take points out of ferocity, that, uh, that tier 4 talent in the BM tree, and invest them into monster slaying or humanoid slaying as the situation dictates. Next spec up is the tryhard spec. This is one that people thought the breakpoint was a lot lower originally. I originally put it as 500 because that that seemed to be the consensus up until we started talking about this. So what, what is this spec, the tryhard spec? This is like the super late game spec if you have a ton of agility. Uh, the theory is that you're going to get a lot of benefit from this plus 15% agility bonus deep in, this, in survival called lightning reflexes. Now, um, this is going to allow hunters to scale like into the super, super late game. You still get one point to aspect of the hawks so that's still on the table for you thing is i think uh so iron gooch and fade and some of these really top tier hunters were testing it and they think that the break point is around a thousand i don't know for sure i don't think anyone knows for sure but this is uh something you're just gonna have to test maybe you enjoy the the play style of the spec a little bit more but it's the lightning reflex spec so that from their perspective it was the type of thing where like you only reach this break point in like full nax gear full world buffs con consumes and the second you die you're going to be performing um performing less optimally than that uh the, the 2031 build uh you also do lose true shadow which is like a solid 500 ap you're losing to yourself and in, in the group like it's 100 per, per person right and the last spec is the self-reliant spec this is one i use for farming great for mardon doing princess runs you get intimidation it's got really high threat component to intimidation really good for soloing stuff uh you get the increased focus regeneration you get spirit bond which is kind of meh uh you can take one point i think it's called frenzy you see that see that talent down there where it's four out of five you can take one point out of that or two um it'll still be pretty much uh always always gonna have the uptime on it this is gonna maximize the potential of your pet and uh, he's gonna just be one badass mofo so if you're trying to do some solo content this is something you want to keep in your back pocket Next up is Hunter Pets. Love talking about Hunter Pets. Everyone loves talking about Hunter Pets. One of the coolest reasons, best reasons to play Hunter. You get your trusty companion fighting by your side. Love Hunter Pets. And uh, that's one of the biggest misconceptions you're going to hear about Hunters. Oh man, your pet is kind of worthless in raids. It's just going to die. It does like no damage. Um, you talk to some of the best Hunters, they're going to tell you, you can use your, your pet in like 95% of fights in vanilla. And that even in like full Nax gear, your pet's going to be doing like 10% of your damage. So it's nothing to laugh at. Your pet's your trusted little buddy. You want to, uh, you know, you want to optimize your pet. So here's a brief annotated history of hunter pets. I went back to WoW Wiki and I researched patch by patch to try and figure this all out and get the story straight once and for all. I didn't even know about a lot of this stuff. So patch 1.3 was the first wave of pet normalization. Up until that point, you have to consider six things when choosing a pet breed. Breed stats. So as you guys may or may not know, uh, pets in vanilla are balanced around uh, stat modifiers, negative 10%, the positive 13% across three things, armor, damage, and health. So that attack speed, pursuit speed, that's your actual running speed on your pet. So pets had different variable running speeds. You had pets like Tack the Leaper, Rare Raptor out of the Barrens that could catch people on mounts. Really, really cool. 
Uh, then you also had resistances. So some pets like Snarler had really high magical resistances across the board. Base attack damage type, you guys know about this most likely. Lupos, the, the rare wolf out of Duskwood dealing shadow damage. That was a consideration. So all the tame beasts would retain their natural values in these respects. Created a ton of flavor and diversity with the pets. And then in 1.3, first wave of normalization, they normalized only pet resistances at this time. The next patch, this is the dreaded pass for, patch for hunters. Big nerf to hunters with the Lupos nerf. 1.9, they nerfed pursuit speed. And they nerfed the base attack uh, damage. So they normalized it all in the physical damage. Um, all the pets were doing about the same damage. Um, you know, within the breed. Within the breed, right? So... Uh, let's see. They also added a couple pet abilities at this point. They added the scorpion poison thing, and they added thunder stomp on, uh, on gorillas, that AOE thunderclap thing on a one-minute cooldown. All right, so Classic WoW will likely have 1.12 mechanics. It's highly unlikely that Lupos will be uh, dealing shadow damage and stuff like that. So you're just going to have to deal um, with three things. Attack speed. In PvE, it's a non-factor. Big misconception. I personally... To be honest, I didn't know this until doing this guide. I always thought BT was the best, like the 1.0 attack speed had implications in both PvE and PvP. But in PvE, it all kind of like balances out. So don't worry about attack speed in PvE. It's just But these are the three factors in general. So PvP is still a big factor for pushback. Attack speed, breed abilities, and breed specific mo stat modifiers that we talked about before. Those are the three things you have to worry about. All right, moving on. So we're going to talk about the different breeds. I have a little note about some of these. Carrion Birds, one of the most underrated pets in the game. I'm not going to use them in a raid, but for leveling, dude, Carrion Birds are fantastic. They have a phenomenal stat profile. They have high armor, which moves the needle most out of anything when it comes to survivability. They also have Screech. It's an AoE damage dealing like blast. It reduces attack power of all enemies in melee range by at max rank 100. Mobs out in the open world get affected a lot more than players by attack speed reduction. So super good. Deals damage as well. Um... They also can learn Bite, Claw, Coward, Dive, Growl. Like, carrion Birds might be able to learn more skills than any other pet, and they're very slept on. When's the last time you saw a Hunter leveling with a Carrion Bird? Then we got Owls. They have Screech as well. Higher damage than a Carrion Bird. Really great to level with as well. Claws also a fantastic focus dump. It's better than Bite in uh, many, if not all, respects. Bats kind of in the same boat. Only other pet, aside from Broken Tooth, that has a 1.0 attack speed, the Bloodseeker Bat. Then we got Cats. Highest damage patent, highest highest damage pet in the game. If you factor in that uh, plus ten percent modifier to damage, plus also prowl, technically gives you a little bit uh, of edge. So all at the cost of only minus two percent HP. This is why you see the majority of hunters using a cat. If you're going to use a cat in PV, don't worry about the attack speed. Just pick up any cat. Make sure you have max rank focus thumbs. We'll get into that more later though. And then we got Wind Serpents. Wind Serpents have an awesome focus thumb. It's got no cooldown. Deals magical damage. It's lightning breath and it's ranged which is nutty. Only bad thing is that rank 6 of this focus stump doesn't come out till ZG. Um, it's good in situations where you need the range damage. If magical damage is going to be of benefit to you, it's good. Another great thing about them is they eat bread. They can You can feed them the mage bread, so you save a little money. Always going to have food for them. Great high damage pet. Decent stats. Uh, can't learn claw. Can only learn bite, though. So one thing to think about. All right. Boar family. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit. Good tank pet. Has charge, only pet with a CC effect. Low damage though, after that initial charge burst, minus 10% damage. Good pet overall though, solid. Wouldn't be my first choice, but it's a good pet. Wolf, Furious Howl. Um, a lot of hunters have been talking to you saying that the damage bonus you get from cats will kind of be roughly the same of the damage plus bonus you're going to get from the wolf buff. So the, this Furious Howl buff at max, max rank is going to give people in your party within 15 yards... They're going to receive uh, uh, an extra 45 to 58 damage to their next physical attack. So the extra damage you're going to get from, from a cat kind of balances this out. But in a situation where you might not be able to get high uptime with your cat, a wolf might be more beneficial or just depending on a bunch of different circumstances. Uh, wolves can't learn claw. Turtle, awesome tanky pet. They have plus 13% armor. That is absolutely nutter butters. They have a shell shield. So if you're really trying to attrition something out and, and not worried about damage and you're going kind of slow and steady wins the race turtle might be uh might be really good for you raptor nothing really too crazy gorilla nothing really too crazy he's got that thunder stomp one minute cooldown scorpion's pretty good in pvp bears spiders no webs in vanilla sadly uh let's keep let's get through the pets we talked about the main ones 
All right, here's the pets listed by attack speed, sub 2.0 attack speed. Most pets have a 2.0 attack speed, but the ones that are are like faster are listed here. Here's the holy trinity of pets. Son of a car is BIS Wind Serpent because it has the highest rank of uh, lightning breath. It can eat bread, 2.0 attack speed. Uh, BIS Cat is Broken Tooth, even doesn't have, even though it's not necessarily better attack speed than in like PVE. Then in like PvP, 1.0 attack speed will still help you in PvP and still give you some sort of uh, edge. So I would say Broken Tooth is BIS. And then BIS Wolf is likely um, Death Maul. Uh, again, it has some PvP implications. It has a very fast attack speed for a wolf. Most wolves are 2.0. It has rank 4 Furious Howl. Uh, but can only learn Bite. All right. So Beast Training. The most important part of Beast Training. One of the most important parts of having a pet in a raid and managing it is... Uh, correctly beast training and having the right resistances trained. Ideally, you want to get your resist your resistances trained up to 180, which is resistance cap, and have these resistances pertain to the exact raid that you're doing. One thing that I never did that I've learned by doing this guide, talking to Fade, um, was that even if you're going to go do a little BG or something, or just do a little something, like get into the habit, get into the mentality of respecting your pet. It's very cheap to do, and uh, it's something that uh, could help you out. So if you're doing PvP, you're going to go respect for a BG, get max rank frost resistance, stuff like this. So at max loyalty level, which is 6, you're going to have 300 training points. We're going to show you how to invest those training points. So your tier, uh, here's the beast training tips. So pretty much natural armor, you're not going to see just training this. It's not that useful because pretty much if your pet's getting hit by the boss, it's going to die anyway. It's not going to help you that much. Resistance is going to be way better, uh, as you know, or maybe you don't know. In Classic WoW, your your pet, it's not like retail, where you have some massive uh, reduction to AoE damage. Like, you're taking full damage on your pet. So the resistances are pretty nice. Pretty, pretty worthwhile. Uh, and then if you see us downranking great stamina, it's because you can't afford higher ranks. Uh, and then frost resistance, the lack of max ranks frost resistance in Nax when we get to it. Where, uh, it there's only two bosses in Nax that do frost damage, Saffron and KT. And Saffron is kind of a moot point. It's too much damage anyway. It's not worth it. And then KT, you will get some decent value, but there's going to be more impact to be had from training nature and shadow and, and max uh, resistances. Okay. So MCBWL, you're going to rock out max rank fire and shadow. The reason why you're going to see shadow across the board for every raid tier is because there's a CC implication with it. If your pet gets feared one time, you're potentially losing thousands of damage. And that is no bueno. So having the shadow resistance is really clutch. Um... Fire resistance and MCBWL. So yeah, this is this what this is what your what your beast training is gonna look like. Two max rank resistances at 90 a pop. That's 180. Then you're gonna train two max rank focus dumps. 25 a pop. That's 50. Then you're gonna train max rank max rank movement speeds. So that's gonna be diver dash at 25. Uh, growl is free. Great stamina at 25. And then a couple minor resistances. And this is gonna kind of fluctuate a little bit raid to raid, but. We'll see. So for ZG AQ, you're going to go Shadow Nature with Splashing into Arcane and Fire. Uh, for Nax, you're going to go Shadow Nature, Splashing into Frost and Fire. <clears throat> All right. So here's a couple slides on where to train max rank abilities. We'll get into this too much. You can just uh, reference this when you when you uh, when you have to do this stuff. Um, how does Hunter BIS work? All right. This is this is interesting to talk about. So Hunter BIS works uh, in this way. It works in like set bonuses. So some of the other classes, they may have to wear like a hodgepodge of mo of lots of different gear from different places. Hunter's pretty clean. It's one of the cool things about playing a hunter. You look pretty badass. You get to rock out your full set, extract full value from your set bonuses. You're basically going like full tier 1 to full tier 2 to full tier 3. You might get full tier 2.5 situationally, um, but that's kind of a cool thing. And then we already talked about the range weapon progression. There's only like really four that you're trying to go for. Um, you know, you may get another weapon here or there that might be better, but, uh, those are like the four main ones you're going for. Um, and pretty much, uh, it's pretty straightforward and that's in that sense. So the tier pieces are rated pretty highly for hunters. Here are some thoughts from Raziah on the tier pieces. I won't get into these cause these are his words, not mine, but they're very interesting on, uh, nonetheless. So definitely go and uh, read these. Um, some very, very cool thoughts. So pretty much he, we're going to get into pre-raid BIS now. All right, so here's the guide key. We've labeled um, the we've, we've labeled the gear. Like if it's not available on uh, launch or something like that, we've put Dire Maul or we've put AQ or we've put ZG. So you can get a sense of what stage you can get certain things. Because some of the BIS lists that we've seen, they just kind of lay the gear out and then you try and get it and you realize, oh, it doesn't come out for a little while. So this could be helpful to you. 
Anyway, Helm options, Backwood Helm is probably going to be Biss here, but a lot of times you're going to need that hit early, so you might have to go with Mask of the Unforgiven, but Backwood Helm is pound for pound probably better. All right, neck options. Mark of the Forgering uh, is probably best. It's very easy to get. You should do that Tyrion quest. Um, Pendant of Solari is probably better, but it doesn't come out until the dungeon sets come out when uh, I think it's AQ40. Um, so probably, unless you're joining the game a little bit later, uh, probably just get Mark of the Forgering. Uh, for shoulder options, you're going to go True Strikes. Everybody and their mama wants True Strikes, though, so we got a couple of options for you. Pre-Raid Biss Cape options, Cape of the Black Baron, super good. Uh, Pre-raid biz chest options. So this is something I didn't know. Beast stalker. If you can get all four pieces and get this the set bonus of plus forty AP, it's going to be pre-raid biz. But if you can't, if you can't get the four pieces, don't use it. And cadaverous armor is your next best uh, next best bet. But uh, good luck farming it. Next thing up. Oh, these are just uh, more more chest options for you. Next up, same with bracers, beast stalkers, uh, biz. If you can get all four. Um, if not, Bracers of the Stone Princess, really easy to get because you can do Maradon, like piece of cake, any spec really. It's a little more annoying as Marks, but you can totally do it. Uh, so yeah, Bracers of the Stone Princess, but there's a couple options here. And then uh, Glove, Devil Swords, you guys know how good Devil Swords. Actually though, Gauntlets of Accuracy, um, I think it's, it might be Dharma West, Ileana, Raven Oak. Those are actually not bad for a green. Um, all right, so belt, beast stalker, same deal. Warpwood binding is is, is pre raid best. Other than that, for legs, devil sore le leggings, again, super good. Boots, wind reaver greaves, or beast stalkers. Uh, ring options. Don Julio's band would technically be pre raid best, but again, it requires the BGs to be out, and it requires you to grind out that AV uh, rep, which is kind of annoying. So most likely, you're probably just gonna go. Double Tarnished Elven Ring out of uh, Dire Mall North Tribute. You're going to be doing Tribute Runs like crazy anyway, and they're super good, the Tarnished Elven Rings. You could also get Blackstone Ring um, if for some reason it doesn't drop for you or something. Blackstone Ring drops off Princess and Mardon. People like pay you to run them through Mardon to get it because it's a lot of pre raid bits for a lot of classes. But I'd say Tarnished Elven Ring or Blackstone Ring, um, or yeah, those are probably the ones you'll realistically get. Trinkets, all these are super good. Just get all of them. The one on the right, Guard Captain, Rune of the Guard Captain, is Horde only, but it's really good, man. Like 20 attack power, 1% hit, super good. You get it from a random quest in Hinterlands. But uh, Black Hand's Breath, man, you're going to be using that, like swapping to it after you're using uh, uh, Active Trinket, uh, Royal Seal of Eldrathala, so good. And it's got Fire Resistance on it too for your Fire Resistance set. Definitely just try and pick up all three of these. Uh, pre raid Bis Melee Weapon. So if you can get both of them, Dalrens is pre raid bis, but good luck again. Everybody and their mama wants Dalrens, but if you can get them in, man, just need roll, whatever. Like, they look so cool, and it's like a rite of passage in vanilla to get double Dalrens. So much fun. So, yeah, Dalrens would be pre raid bis. Um, other than that, you can get Barbarous Blade out of uh, Dire Maul. You'll be able to get that easy doing the uh, tribute runs. Also, Fiendish Machete. This is crazy. I didn't know about this. Shout out to Al Alondris for, for pointing this out to me, but pretty much these. Uh, drop in Dire Maul and in Molten Core, they're pretty nutty. Like, if you have both, you're going to have plus 72 attack power when fighting elementals, plus 10 agility as well. So, if you have them, just throw them on for the elemental fights and it really should move the needle quite a bit. Huntsman Harpoon, that's in Dire Maul as well. A lot of the pre best stuff is in Dire Maul. Um, some more options for you here. Bone Slicing Hatchet. I remember back in the day seeing hunters walking around with double Bone Slicing Hatchet with Agi on it. It looks so cool. Uh, pre raid bis ranged weapon. So, Bloodseeker has slight edge when it comes to the speed and damage range compared to Black Crow. Uh, it's very easy to acquire as well. You just gotta win one game in AV. But if uh, Classic launches with no honor system or no BGs or whatever, which it seems like it will likely do, then you're gonna want to get Black Crow. That's a nightmare to farm. Uh, good luck. But, yeah. Alright, pre raid bis quiver and ammo. Harpy hide quiver is the best quiver. Uh, second behind uh, Sinew Wrapped Lamina, uh, you get this one through uh, getting re getting uh, re revered with uh, Frostwolfer's Thrumpike and AV. So the, the ammo you're going to be using, you're going to be using either Thorium Shells or Thorium Headed Arrows. To get the arrows, you actually have to turn in the shells at a vendor. It doesn't, you can't just craft arrows directly. Doomshot is technically the best ammo forever, but uh, like you can't really reliably farm that. It's such a nightmare doing LBRS, but they pretty much always drop off the same guy that drops the Black Crow. 
Um, but she drops like you know like 83 or something like that. So if you have Doomshot, you can use it. And if you really want to go super try hard. Anyway, progressive uh, rating BIS. Here are the lists. I won't get into each piece right here, but you can again reference this PowerPoint. Um, if you click the link and be able to look at all these pieces on an individual basis, this is taking you all the way through Vanilla Man, every phase of the game. So you're going to know what your BIS lists are. We've also put some uh, resistance sets in here. So here's a fire resistance set. The, the cap is 315. Paladins and Shamans give 60, though. So you really only need like 255 if you're going super deep with it. Then here's the nature resistance one. And here's the frost one. So uh, the rest of this guide, man, is really just like stuff that I can't really talk about too much. I mean, we're, we're, we're talk I'm listing out the enchantments here um, chronologically. So like for your head enchant, you're going to be using plus eight Agi. Then when ZG comes out, you're going to be using the ZG enchants, right? So you'll see how the enchants change. But this is stuff that's better, you know, learned just by clicking the guide. So I'm not going to talk about this stuff too much. We got world buffs as well. So these the world buffs aren't necessarily listed from important to most important to least important. Those are just all the world buffs that are kind of applicable to you in some sense, and you can kind of just do what you need to do. We also have a section for consumable buffs. Um, everything really listed out, everything all the way to the bog the boggling root, man. You heard me talk about that on stream the other day. One damage, man. You gotta gotta show up to raid with your boggling root. Um, food buffs. We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Hang in there. I'll just talk about gold real quick and we'll wrap up. So these are all the buffs and you know consumables that you might want to have access to. We even got a slide for engineering stuff as well. Okay, here's a good slide actually. I'll talk about this for a minute. Here is a slide on weapons by full or clip damage rotation. I talked about this earlier. So on a on a case by case basis, depending on what weapon you have, you're going to want to use a different version of the rotation. Most of the time it's going to be full, but sometimes it's going to be clipped, and sometimes during the normal normal rotation, so without a quick shots or a rapid fire proc or whatever, you're going to use the full, and then during a rapid fire you're going to use clipped, as you can see, for example, with the bow of taut sinew. It just maths out in really weird ways, guys. But if you have a weapon and you're like, huh, what, you know, what version of the rotation should I use? You can come to this guide and just check it out. All right, so we've also listed all the raid mob types and all the different raids. So you can see this is with regard really to that survival tier one talent, monster slaying or humanoid slaying. You can basically figure out, you know, if you want to invest some points into those. Um, so this is hopefully a little bit useful for you, all the raid mob types. Here's a, a link to watch uh, to Watcher 6's Master DPS Simulator. This is what we use to help calculate a lot of the stat weights if you want to mess around with it. Last thing I'm going to talk about is Hunter Income. We talked about this. There's three Tier 1 methods to my mind when it comes to Hunter Gold Farming. Uh, there's Dire Marl North Tribute Runs, which is probably King. Um, you can get sick gold per hour. There's links to all the guys to do them. Uh, you can do about 3 an hour. You get about 120 gold an hour. Sometimes even more if you get like um, the Forest Companion of Dragon Slaying Dropping or something like that. Also, Mardon Princess Runs. It's pretty quick to get the scepter and then you can do five an hour and if you have herbalism you can stretch the, the gpm even more um if you can fit in killing uh the stone guy uh, up top you can stretch the gpm even more you can sell blackstone ring runs to people and the third thing is skinning devil sword leather in angora we talked about that so here's a little more color on each of the individual gold farming methods but uh i think that's about it guys i don't want to take too much of your time up um this is a long video i hope you enjoyed it Again, please come go check this guide out. Comment on it. Let's improve it together. Let me know down in the comments below, you know, which which class you want to see next. If you did enjoy this, what things constructive feedback that we can improve. The format of these, they do take a ton of work, so I'd appreciate, you know, maybe an upvote or something like that. Or so if you know someone who wants to play Hunter and Classic, forward them the guide. It would definitely help me out. But other than that, guys, I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.